Yeah, I wanted to, um, I wanted to thank John because um, my wife and I, we've been trying to have a baby for ever since I've known John. And uh, um, he was able to grow his family through the magic of adoption. And uh, last year, in September time frame, we, we uh, were matched for adoption. And obviously, you saw the picture of little baby Dylan. And he's fantastic. He's here with me today. So I, I can't, I'm every day taking 1,000 pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, uh, I like to call, I like people to call me Dr. Dan because Dr. Miroff is a, I come from a long line of Dr. Miroffs and they're all proctologists. So if you need a <laughs> colonoscopy, uh, <laughs> um, you know, you know who to talk to, but if you need some environmental work done, call Dr. Dan, right? <laughs> And um, as, as John mentioned, I'm the director of the laboratories for uh, engineered environmental solutions at FAU. And this is where all of our, this is the same website where all of our uh, Hinckley Center projects, uh, all, all the reports and all of the tag meetings and all of the progress uh, information is there. And if you can stay awake long enough to slide number 350, there's going to be, <laughs> There's going to be some places where I'm going to need your input as you know, prominent members of the, the um, state of Florida's solid waste industry. So if it's faster, you can take a picture of that weird thing in the corner. I'm told by students it'll take you directly to the page. If not, you can just type this. It's a very short uh, URL. Uh, so also, John mentioned that we do a lot of different um, kinds of work. When I I was originally at the University of Miami and I went to, I always lived very close across the street to FAU and I was very fortunate that my neighbor across the street from my house at the cul-de-sac, he got a job, he was a, a faculty member in ocean engineering, I never knew it, and uh, he got a job at the University of Kentucky and I actually got his job, which is the coolest thing in the whole world. What a small, small place. And so I cut down my commute by two and a half hours one way to go to FAU. And so 2003, I was the environmental engineering professor. So I got a chance to do all this kind of work. Now that I'm uh, the associate chair, and last year we started our environmental engineering bachelor's degree program at FAU, we are hiring in these areas uh, new faculty members. So if there are students here who are planning to graduate in the summer, there'll be a job posting available or an uh, assistant professor at FAU in one of these fields coming out here in August. So I wanted to talk about this uh, very interesting project started about a year and a half ago. And we wanted to look at how landfill managers deal with odor complaints. So we had our students ride along during these visits when some irate neighbor of a landfill is upset that when they walked out the door they smelled something. They didn't realize that when they bought the house, of course, there's a giant mountain of garbage <laughs> providing shade to their home. But uh, So it was very interesting to get a chance to see how those are recorded. And we went to different um, landfills. And we have disguised their name in this presentation. We also looked at um, the different meteorological conditions maybe we were, we'd be able to predict when the magical set of conditions are occurring that will cause that uh, irate neighbor to pick up the phone and call. And so I'll present some data on this. And as an aside, when I was writing the proposal for this project way back, you know, I was probably late for class, doing 16 different things at the same time, and I like to read my news on the cell phone while I'm doing something else, not driving. And uh, I came across that some researcher in Portugal had discovered the genes that can code the human order binding protein. And I looked into this idea. I said, this could be a really interesting way to measure odors. And so I wrote the proposal after that, doing some work. And uh, we've done some work in our lab and we've actually teamed up with that professor over in uh, Portugal who did that first study. 
So this is a, a landfill in South Florida. And as you can see, there's some very nice, I was told not to press that button. <laughs> so I got you. <laughs> so there's some brand new townhouses built up right next door on the fence line. Perfect spot. Downwind, of course, right? So the challenges for the, the solid waste um, manager is to deal with the different, you have no control over the environmental conditions. You don't have control over somebody deciding to move right at the fence line. Uh, you don't have control over your, possibly you're zoned into um, an industrial area and you've got other neighbors who are producing odors, but because the, the folks in the community can see the landfill and not this other neighbor, they automatically point the finger. You don't have control over the fact that some people are very, very sensitive, and we'll talk about that later. Um, you don't have control over the fact that we don't have technologies that can really distinguish the different types of odors and where they're coming from and how, what their concentrations are really well yet. And I'll talk about that too. And uh, some odors impact each other. They mask each other, which is great. Sometimes they make it way worse. That's called synergistic. This could be a problem as well. And finally, some people have a really in, uh, enhanced sense of smell. And some people maybe working at the landfill, their, their uh, sense of smell has been dulled for, for many years of, of working in that area. Now, the graphic on the corner is, has nothing to do with odor. It's about eyesight. So <laughs> you, if you can read that, you get an A in the class, right? <laughs> well, basically, these are all the different types of odors that are found at landfills. The odor wheel is sometimes the landfill managers use to try to describe what they're smelling when they're, they go um, to an odor complaint visit. The biggest problem still is the subjectivity that some folks are really hypersensitive, and some are completely nose blind, and they're talking to each other, and the regulator is in Tallahassee and nowhere near the order. So it's how do, how do we describe it, who's right, who's wrong? So the, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later to try to figure out if there's a way we can take that out of the equation and come up with a way to measure orders without this, without the human element clouding the, the, the issue. So our first step was we looked at well, we, we, we gathered some odor complaint data from several urban landfills. And we isolated the days in which there was at least three odor complaints filed from the big list. And we looked at the dates when there was no odor complaints, so the inverse of that group, uh, minus the one and, two day, uh, one and two complaints. And then we looked at random days that had no complaints, that had similar environmental conditions to the days where there were three or more complaints. And you could probably guess what we found. Nothing, because the data set's too small. But I'm gonna go ahead and show you 350 graphs that show you that there's nothing. But anyway, we, <laughs> we looked at the, uh, about 3,000, 4,000 order complaints from an uh, 11 year period. Uh, we looked at you know, where's the max year, we looked at seasonal variations, monthly, daily, and time of the day. And the maximum year in this group, in this set of data that we had was uh, 2014. And uh, it was, there were more complaints in the wet season versus dry season. There was more in the September than there were in any other month. Tuesday seemed to be the highest day, but it's not a big difference. You can see I was just grabbing a typical graph, so you don't have to look at all the other ones. And the, the, best, uh, the most complaints came in the afternoon. Then we had a partnership with the uh, iSense Center we, at, at Florida Atlantic University, which is in Boca, not Miami, by the way. Um, it's, uh, we have this concept called pillars and platforms. And so one of our pillars is this iSense Center. So we're supposed to be one of our main six things that FAU is known for in the universe is for developing sensors. So we teamed up with the iSense folks. And they helped us to, to uh, install these uh, meteorological stations at the landfill sites. So we could get up to the second data directly to our cell phone. So whenever the, the order complaint occurred, we would know exactly what the weather conditions were on at the landfill. And we, 
we were able to record temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, direction, and precipitation. And we tried to look at, we don't record this, but we tried to find a way to come up with a way to measure atmospheric stability. And later on, I'll show you kind of what we ended up doing. And then we did a whole bunch of statistical analysis, but I already gave away the interesting part. It shows really nothing, because the data set is too small. There are some interesting, like, empirical things that pull, you can pull out by looking at the data. There's some interesting possibilities when you look at the data, but still statistically not strong enough because the data set, again. And so here, later on, we'll show you that pressure drop showed something exciting, and the stability class may be exciting, so we decided to pull those apart. Temperature uh, and uh, relative humidity were very related, and so we're, later on, I'll show you how those got combined. And this is my student, Matea uh, Vidovic, who uh, just got married last month in Croatia to her longtime boyfriend. And she just accepted a job at SCS Engineers, I was told, this morning. So she's now working across the street uh, from us at, in Boca. And uh, this is her work. She will hopefully graduate in two weeks with her master's degree. And like we said earlier, there was no way that the meteorological data that we collected could predict when a, uh, an order event that would cause a complaint would, would to be, uh, occur. And she looked at some complicating factors in the data set that was causing it very, very, make it very difficult to resolve the data. So she recommended new data to be collected at order complaint verification visits. So she has like a little checklist or a question sheet that the uh, representative from the landfill would take with them to get the information they need when they verify that the order complaint is actually real. And that's a draft right there because we need your help. Like a lot of, a a lot of times we have, we have an excellent tag group and they're very uh, into it, but they're uh, usually only located in South Florida and so here we have the whole state of Florida, so I, I really want to know if you're interested in uh, assisting us to develop this at, statewide and make it more usable to all of the 50 plus landfills that we have, then we need your input in, before we roll this thing out. So it's going to be coming out uh, in the next week or two. So stay tuned to my website and please, uh, if you don't know how to get to my website, I have plenty of cards, please come see me. Uh, I, I notice that everyone's still awake, so somebody will please come to see me to give some input on that. There's a couple more places where we'll need that too. So instead, instead of looking at specific data points in the meteorological characteristics of the day or the day before an event, uh, we came up with the idea of having this order threat assessment level. It's kind of like, you know, the DEF CON 3 thing or the, the terror threat assessment thing. And so uh, we color coded it here and we based it on the parameters that we thought had a lot of impact on whether orders can be detected off site. And those are wind speed direction in kind of one category. The temperature, humidity, we're going to show you how it's combined in a second. Precipitation, the stability class, which is something that we could, we're, we're looking into right now. And the pressure drop. So I'll go over each one real quick and show you how we score them. So with wind speed and direction, we use the Buford number. It has the, that, reply, uh, that corresponds to a miles per hour number that you can get from your, your uh, meter, meteorological station. And you just have to know where your key receptor location is. I mean, I, I had several different landfills and their nearest neighbors that like to complain a lot or are not always uh, directly southeast or directly north. So it so depend on the, where your landfill is, who are your key receptors. Then you would know that direction. And then using the direction of the wind here, you can get a different score. So if you're crosswind, the score would be three. Okay, so then we combine temperature and humidity using the dew point. 
score. And same deal here, I've color coded them for you, so if the dew point is higher than 75 degrees, there's more likely a uh, chance that there will be an order complaint filed if the winds and all the other things are, are the magic numbers. For, for rainfall, we did the same thing. We looked at um, how, how intense was the rainfall in the previous three days. That seemed to enhance odor detection. Also, literature says that that is true. And when we were looking at the data, it's not, it's not um, statistically obvious, but it is empirically kind of evident that that's also true. And then everyone we talk to says that is the case at the landfills too. Uh, stability class is a little bit tricky one to measure, but we have this idea of putting two temperature sensors, one at ground level maybe at the, at the fence, line and one at the top of the hill so we can get an estimate of how much the vertical temperature gradient is changing. Using that number we can, in the middle column here, it's uh, this thing here, we can get to an estimate of the atmospheric stability. So for example, um, if it's uh, extremely unstable, that means it's, very, it's mixing a lot so the, the uh, odors don't travel as far. So this is a, a good condition, it's low, that there will be an order complaint. Whereas if it's strongly stable, then the orders can pers persist for a long time. The only thing that this doesn't have is the um, temperature inversion layers. It's possible if your hill is high enough that you may be above that, so the, the orders would travel up always and not bother anyone down here. And then on some days, the temperature inversion layer could be just above the hill, and then all of the uh, odors or emissions would fumigate the neighbors, right? So there's a possibility that that would be incorporated into here with more data. And the pressure drop is still a work in progress, but the overnight pressure drops seem to be useful when we looked at the data uh, empirically, but again, not, not strongly uh, statistically supported. So we need more study to develop a scale, so we have a blank here that we'll be filling in as uh, we get more information from other landfills. So another opportunity for input if you would like us to look at your order complaint data and we will not say your name out in any place, obviously, to, because no one needs to know that landfills have orders, right? <laughs> so there's an example of two ways we could score this. Now that we have created the threat assessment uh, index here, so I, I did an example, right? So here we have the wind speed and the, the direction. And we've scored them here on the color scale. And this is the um, dew point, and this is the precipitation, and this is the atmospheric stability, and this is the change in pressure, right? I haven't got a scale yet for that one, so I put a number with a question mark. I'm not sure yet. We'll, we'll get to that. And so there's a couple ways we could do this. We could say, well, score it to the maximum one of these data points. So the worst case scenario was the dew point was high, so that would be orange, which is severe. So for example, a landfill manager would, could elect to say, you know what, today maybe we won't, uh, we won't drill new landfill gas wells today because it's a possibility of, uh, a severe possibility of someone getting an order complaint into us. Or we might say, you know what, we won't be uh, accepting the biosolid truck today, maybe we uh, delay that shipment, or something of that nature. And in Matea's thesis, she's working on some of these operational things that can be at the top of the priority list to be altered based on the score. So again, if anyone is interested in this work at all, or has any, you know, two or three cents, whatever you want to put in, of your you know, lifetime of experience at the landfill. I mean, uh, we need your input. These things only work as well as the data, right? And you saw, with the small data set, I, I can't give you more, a stronger uh, results. I, I need more people to look at this and give me their input. So this will be available on our website again in a couple of weeks. I know this because the thesis due date is tomorrow at FAU, so I'm going to be reading quite a bit of stuff 
tonight and tomorrow morning. In the second part of our research, uh, we were looking at this human order binding protein and we wanted to develop a biosensor that would be able to quantify the orders. So this is the technology that we have right now to be able to quantify orders. It looks kind of ridiculous a little bit sometimes. I don't know, has any, any of you ever tried the nasal ranger or have you been a panelist? Uh, so it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of the dark ages. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a tricorder like in Star Trek and we just write, know exactly the number? So that I'm kind of headed in that direction. So these are all need to be calibrated based on some human order panel some experts that know exactly what an order is. It would be nice if those people also lived in our neighborhoods that are near the landfills, but that's not the case. So everyone is different, it's real tricky. So what if instead we looked at the order measurement problem as a challenge instead? Maybe there's just too many different constituents in the order to be able, it's not just hydrogen sulfide, as you saw from that one little wheel that had a thousand uh, small little writing on it with all the different uh, constituents that can cause odors. And if we looked at it like uh, the BOD test in wastewater, so it's an indirect composite test, we ask the bugs to eat the organisms and we measure the oxygen instead of measuring each organic compound by itself, which would cost millions of dollars for one test, it makes no sense, that's crazy. The same deal with odors, if we try to measure every single one of them, it would cost a million dollars per sample, that's why we don't do that and thankfully FDP doesn't require that we measure all million of them. And so this is the idea that we were trying to come up with. Instead of microorganisms in this case, we're using the odor binding protein which humans use to smell. So we look at this inspiration of how biology works. Basically an odorant molecule could be fresh smelling or could be very foul, uh, is in the air and needs to be transported to the receptors that are trained in your body from birth to recognize that signal as a type of odor. Now there's uh, some odors that are extremely soluble and can go directly to the receptor, but most odors need to be shepherded to the receptor. And the compound that does that is the human odorant binding protein. And there it is. It looks like a um, fried egg over there on the left side. In the cartoon, of course. It doesn't look like that. I'll show you what it kind of looks like in a computer depiction in a section. So my friend over at the uh, University of Braga in Portugal, he, f he isolated the plasma, the human plasmid that writes the code to make the human order binding protein. And he sent it to us, airmail. And when we got it, we're like, this is great. So we spliced it into uh, E. coli and we grew them up and we tried to see if we had any human order binding proteins made and there were none. And then we said, well, maybe it was because of the first time we tried it, so we tried it again and again and again. And I realized that maybe the plasmid got destroyed on its way from Portugal to here. So we asked him to put it into the E. coli, because E. coli travel better than DNA does. And so he did that. It took, a, it took a while for them to figure out how to do that. And then he sent us the E. coli with this DNA from humans that makes this order binding protein inside of it and then we grew that up in our lab and so we have now unlimited quantities of human order binding protein that we can use that's this uh this thing for you'll see it a bunch of times in, from now on it's just long waves it's a short way of saying human order binding protein so our thought process was that it will bind to the odors and if we can put a fluorescent tag on, on the compound itself, then when it's bound, we will know, and when it's not bound, we'll know, and we'll be able to tell if we flood it with more odorants, more of them will be bound, and so there'll be more, a uh, higher signal. And maybe that signal is uh, quantitative, and that's Beer's Law. It has nothing to do with alcohol, but you're free to consume, as long as you're the proper age. And it turns out that 
human order binding protein is a shepherd compound, so basically it likes to give away the odors, uh, the odorants when it's done. So maybe we don't need to um, have like a cartridge of this stuff every time that you just need to buy one time and you just basically rinse it with fresh air and then it's ready to be used again. So we're working on that too, by the way. So this is the odor binding protein and I've colored it dark because as you can see on the bottom or maybe not in the back of the room, but that's the signal that we're seeing on the uh, spectrophotometer. So it's dark to the spectrophotometer, so it's not causing any interference. And then we have, uh, we had two ideas. We had one, we stuck the fluorophore directly on, so that's the, the signal, the color signal that we added to it. And in this picture here, we have an antibody that has the fluorophore. So both of those we thought would work. Obviously, the antibody fluorophore combination is more expensive, so we started with the fluorophore by itself first. Okay, so these are the, co the components of the biosensor. And they're all dark to the spectrophotometer until they are combined. And see, when it's combined, you see a signal. And we can get that signal, find the maximum uh, wavelength, and we can focus on that and see if we change the concentration, what happens. And I'll show you in a second what that looks like. So here you can see the order is bound to the protein, it changes shape, the color shows up, then when it releases this, it changes shape back to this, and it's dark to the spectrophotometer. That's the idea. And this is my student. Um, hopefully she will also graduate in a, in a week and a half, but I, I just saw an email saying she may want to decide to not, but <laughs> I'm hoping she will do that. So anyway, she ran through all of the uh, tests to make sure that we have a uh, analytical quantity of this human odor binding protein so we can be able to test it with our favorite odor compound, hydrogen sulfide. So this is what she had to run this Bradford assay and here you can see the gel electrophoresis which shows us that we have the protein and how much of it we have and we had a healthy amount that we, we were able to create in each batch and there it is. It doesn't look like much but this that's all we needed for to, to run several tests. So here's our very, very crude uh, setup. Of course, if this does work, we're going to have, we'll, uh, be able to miniaturize it and then set it up so it hooks into your cell phone and you can take it with you on, on your uh, verification visits for order. And here's our hydrogen sulfide tank and we're put, putting in hydrogen sulfide with a mixture of um, nitrogen and it's entering here. We can control the flow rates and it's bubbled through the liquid buffer that contains the human odor binding protein con uh, which is attached to the fluorophore. And then we just take, we pull a sample and we run it through the spectrophotometer and we got some data. So what we were expecting to do is take all those components to make the prototype biosensor. We were going to expose it to hydrogen sulfide for various times, and those times are, will give us the mass flux going through the system, so we would get an idea of the concentration. And this is what Beer's Law looks like. So it's linear at some portion, and then it kind of doesn't get linear anymore. So that part where it's linear is the quantitation range where that's where you want to be. In, when you're measuring, so you either go closer to the source or go farther away from the source with the odor and you get yourself into the quantitation range. In water or other matrices, you would dilute or concentrate the sample so that you could do the same thing, to be in the quantitation range. Our idea was to try to get in, to try to find out what this range would be for hydrogen sulfide in the first year. And hopefully it would have the, it would be linear. And you'll see in a second the exciting results. So we ran the uh, entire <clears throat> biosensor with all the components. This is the fluorophore here. This is, you remember this one. This is the human order binding protein. And we exposed it to hydrogen sulfide. 
And we ran it through and we saw that our peak wavelength is at 485, so, and at different exposure amounts, it starts to decrease, which we were expecting, because the protein is now binding more and more and more of the hydrogen sulfide. So eventually this thing will come to, the, to its end here, a flat line. And that means all the proteins we have in the bottle are matched up with the hydrogen sulfide molecule. So we ran a bunch of tests to try to find out what the saturation limit is for our uh, first biosensor, which was made up of this stuff here. So this is the buffer. That's the concentration of the protein, the concentration of the fluorophore, and this is the hydrogen sulfide that we added in. And so that's our, and it's fairly linear, and this is our quantitation range. At this point, every, we would expect all of the sample to be um, saturated. And the interesting thing is, I didn't bring the data here, but the interesting thing is that we ran it for up to 500 seconds, and something incredibly strange happens around here. We didn't do exactly 190, we did 210. And uh, one, uh, uh, 125. So, but something happens in here, it does a funky thing like that, which we would expect, because it's now uh, ejecting hydrogen sulfide and picking up a new one. So it's coming back up. So it's, we found exactly where this biosensor's limit is. The nice thing about this is you can get your result in whatever 191 seconds is. Instead of having to call up three odor experts to calibrate and then smell things for however long that takes and then pay their Obamacare and all that stuff. Because you have to, hi right, you have to hire them and everything. So this is a lot of expense that you don't have to deal with. <clears throat> so at, um, at a concentration of 5 to 10 micrograms of hydrogen sulfide, if you look at this graph, it's kind of flat over here. And then a little bit less than that, it looks somewhat linear, so it could be quantitative. We're very, very excited. This stuff, I mean, I just got this uh, a week ago. So we're, going, we're running our uh, additional tests now to be able to replicate this and also to check that reversibility that we talked about earlier. So we can turn this line into a concentration value. Our signal that we measure in less than what is that, three minutes, and we'll have a, a basically a total order number. We checked all the components for interference. The nice thing about this is that um, this, these down here, this is like six orders of magnitude lower <laughs> than the actual signal we're getting from the order binding protein. So it, it looks like there's something going on. We would not want to see this. We would want to see, that, that's the worst case scenario. This is what we saw. So none of the components of the biosensor are interfering with the signal that, we're, that we get when we use hydrogen sulfide. Now we haven't done anything other than hydrogen sulfide yet, so I'm not going to be jumping up and down and getting excited and calling uh, Dr. Mazik to figure out how we <coughs> turn this into a money-making venture. But this is very, very exciting. So in year two, I'm teaming up with Dr. Binninger. He's uh, a world-famous um, <coughs> molecular biologist, and we were borrowing his lab for the first year of the experiment. And now we can actually call him uh, part of the study because we got funded to, to bring him in and his students, which it's kind of tricky to have an uh, environmental engineering student working on molecular biology techniques. They don't have any experience or any courses in that. So now we're able to bring in his students to help us out. I think that this will allow us to go much faster in improving the, the uh, yield of of the protein, and also the, uh, we'll be able to get more tests in more rapid succession. Now, so far the, the fluorophore tag seems to be working well, so we're going to continue to work with that. We, we have isolated a company that can get us the monoclonal antibody if we need to go, and uh, maybe with hydrogen sulfide it may not be necessary, but with some other specific orders that we could select, like maybe a mercaptan or something else. Uh, we may need
to go to that because it's a more robust technique. Once we uh, have the monoclonal antibodies, then we can make large amounts of it just the same way that we made the, uh, the protein. But we have to have, pay somebody to make it first. So that's why we didn't go there that route first. Uh, as you can see, we were looking at the inverse response. So the, the, the Beer's Law curve looks like this. And you saw the curve that we found look this way. So we're doing the inverse response. And then we, we are going to, with the hydrogen sulfide, we recently got our hands on a Jerome meter, so we'll be able to correlate our measurements with what this, the, the typical equipment that a uh, solid waste um, manager would have at their disposal for looking at just that one specific odorant. Um, we're also s still interested in some of the other issues in, because this is pure hydrogen sulfide with, with um, nitrogen gas. It's not a, a sample of landfill gas or a sample of air that has some odorant in it. So we are still looking at those issues in year two to see if there's anything that we need to worry about that we would need to pre-treat or have a filter or something like that ahead of time so that it wouldn't interfere. So far we haven't had that, but it's possible, so we're, we keep that on the radar. And when we go to other odorants and other mixtures, we're going to be looking at how that affects that quantitation range, how long you need to pick up the sample, uh, how, um, and how effective will it correlate with the state-of-the-art techniques that we have today. And then can we get the proteins back so you don't have to order them again and again and again? So the goal is to have something uh, this size that you can just attach to your and have a little app. We get the guys from iSense to, to help us out with that because that's what their job is at, at, at FAU. They take our ideas and turn them into commercial products. And um, I, can, I hope that one day we'll be able to have in here a little cell of human odor binding proteins with a little spectrophotometer. They make them that size now and they don't need a lot of power with LED lights and you'll be able to get the signal sent to your phone right away. Be able to know if this is a real order event or not. And I'd like to thank everybody, including the Hinckley Center, and thank all of you for not falling asleep and for staying long enough. It wasn't just that you were going to get a $100 gift certificate from John, that you wanted to listen to my, my uh, update on my research. But also, I'm very interested in what you have to say about the first two items that I put that black slide that says input needed. So please don't be afraid. Send me an email or stop me before I go and look at pictures of my son on my cell phone. And uh, we'll get you those reports and we, and we can get your input into those projects. So just, uh, just to finish up this year, the FAU has uh, honors convocation where they give awards to faculty members and students. So one of the students that worked on this project, Lissandre Meyer, she received the um, University Scholar Award, which is a top honor given to only six students at the entire university of 37,000. And you know this guy here, and I received the Excellence in Innovation in Undergraduate Teaching Award, and we have in, in our department, Civil Environmental Geomatics Engineering, we have 13 faculty members, soon to be 14 next year. And there are, there are 11 university-wide teaching awards, and seven of those went to faculty members in my department. So we have a, a very high commitment to our students and to teaching and to research. Uh, we received the Researcher of the Year Award as well in our department that year. Not myself, but the guy who's across the hall from me. You saw that picture, of course. So I'll give you a new one. <laughs> that's my first Father's Day. That's what it says right there. First Father's Day. And this is my beautiful wife. Oh, by the way, while you're getting your colonoscopy, she does the anesthesia. So she and my dad work together. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> So they're like Dr. Miroff, and they both are, huh, what? Yeah. <laughs> the one is at one end of the table, one is at the other. <laughs> and 
And I practiced my presentation earlier and took this picture in the middle of it. <laughs> but he, he seems to like to hear my voice. That's nice. So that's my business card, and I have real ones if you want in my bag somewhere over there, being guarded heavily. So I didn't bring a question slide, but this is the time. At the time that we were working on this, I, I didn't see anything, but right before I went to Orlando in May to, to the research uh, advisory meeting, um, I decided to do a quick check on my cell phone, and I looked and I saw that um, NASA and the Department of Defense are teaming up to, to do something quite similar to this, actually, <clears throat> but it's looking for explosives on planes and for you know, some type of uh, uh, fuel leaks or things of that nature on the space station. So th it has a lot of um, applications that people are getting excited about. Only because just recently, just two years ago, the, we isolated this, the, the DNA that can write, that can build the human order binding protein. So now people have access to it and they're thinking of what they can do with it. So I can imagine that TSA will have these things and the um, you know, 99 year old grandmother in front of you in line is going to be strip searched because it came for some, <laughs> some, t some type of chemical that looks a lot like, oh, maybe it's siloxane. Because it <laughs> right? she wanted shiny hair, and then it's not an explosive. And it will, but we'll, we'll all get on the plane eventually. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's what, 178,000 new chemicals made every year, and we test for like three of them. We can, we can add, uh, we can take a look at the, the data set that we have and see if that correlates with what uh, other folks are seeing in, the, in those neighborhoods. And we can also, if that's true, and it, it may definitely be true, then we can make an easy adjustment. Because those, uh, those categories can be ca uh, calibrated in the, th the threat assessment. They can be calibrated to your specific landfill, just like we did with the, um, the wind direction. Like you have a key receptor, same deal. If you notice that the types of odors that are endemic to your landfill are worse at these conditions, you can flip the category. So it, it's just a way that you know, everybody at the, at the landfill who's doing operations can take a look and say, is there something we can do today to minimize the impact if there's uh, if the conditions are bad. Um, you know, it doesn't take into account, for example, skyscrapers and such and that, those kind of things. Or if, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere, which most landfills are supposed to be, um, wh what is your key receptor, right? So th those are some kind of things that can be calibrated site-specific. But I definitely want input like that so that we can make sure when we put the, uh, the user guide together that that's clear. For the, all right, definitely. I know right now they're looking at other period as a broad grouping, but would you anticipate that there might be, um, as you look at different odors and see how they react, that we'd be able to do some definition by categories, types, or specific? Yeah, the, if, um, well, let's, 
I'm not going to go back to the slide, but there, if you remember the slide that showed where the maximum uh, wavelength occurred, right? That may be at different uh, wavelengths for different odorants. So that could be a way that we could pull apart some. We haven't done anything with mixtures yet, so I, I don't know where that's headed. But we have some ideas on how we would handle that. We could also sequester some odor so they don't block the signal. Like if someone is using the odor masking agents, that's an odor too, so it would maybe interfere. So we could find a way to block those specifically, and then we would get the odor that's behind it. So it could be that you would have extra modules that you would need to add to the biosensor. The biosensor folks will be happy now that I brought that idea up, because they can sell more of this stuff. Now that it's reversible, they only can sell it one time to you, right? Thank you.